Welcome to M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. From interviews with the leading figures in the industry, to coffee chats with analysts, diversity panels, all the way through to workshops, we'll be covering it all. We do hope you enjoy the video and please give us a like and a follow on our social media. Thank you very much. Hi everybody, welcome to this week's episode of M&A Mondays, the UK's first YouTube series dedicated to all things M&A. My name is Patrick Gorton and I'm the founder and co-head of the UCL M&A Group and alongside me is Sargon Serene, an industrials analyst and an events officer within the group. This week we're absolutely delighted to be joined by Federico Monguzzi. Federico graduated with a master's degree in business, finance and control in 2007 from Bocconi University in Italy. He went on to join Credit Suisse, where he left as an associate in 2014 to join Citigroup. Federico is currently a managing dire director at Citigroup, operating between both London and Milan. We are incredibly delighted to have him today. So without further ado, let's get started. Hi, Federico. How are you? Hey, hi, guys. I'm great. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me. Hopefully I will be constructive for your objective. So it's a pleasure. Well, thank you very much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Um, I guess the first question I'd like to ask you is that, um, you know, you have a lot of experience across different areas of the investment banking division from M&A to equity capital markets and leverage finance. Which yeah. of the areas of IBD do you find the most interesting and why? Um, it's a very nice question. And I think that it's, uh, it's even peculiar that someone really tried a bit of everything. I don't know if because people kick me out from their, you know, team. So just because I get bored pretty soon. No, I have to say that uh, I think that depend a little bit what you want to achieve. But overall, if you want to be a banker that can talk with clients about everything, I think this kind of approach can make sense. Then, of course, you can prefer to be the specialist of some of the product. But personally, for you know the way I always set up my career, so to be a bit more on the coverage side rather than on the product side, I, I really think that has been a useful uh, you know step by step uh, transition plan. In terms of interest, I think, look, to the extent you do something for a relatively short uh, time frame, that for me was like between two to three years, more or less, for each kind of division, I think that remained the most fun part, right? Because you are, you know, you learn, you keep like growing and, and, and knowing different stuff. Uh, then, you know, you need to decide a little bit because I would say that in terms of overall complexities and probably, you know, in, you know, generally interest and difficulties, I have to think that M&A remain probably the most complicated and differentiating factor where you need to be a bit more, if you wish, creative or let's say everything can change time to time. Uh, while if I think more about the product uh, like ECM and leverage finance, of course, it's much easier to make money up there, but the process is very much repetitive. So there is a point in those products where you cheat you achieve a level where a lot it's actually out of your control because it's market driven and so ultimately i mean it's still fun and you know of course like the experience can you know make you a great banker for that product but i would say that conceptually is less uh, you know diversified compared to mna for example um and if i think about the sector it's really you know uh a personal choice for example i could never do like pnu if you ask me but uh, again, it's more to be in the loop for a recurrent, uh, uh, you know, period of time that allow you to know the people in the history and try to, to, you know, to connect the dots between the stuff. So it's more, let's say, a relationship perspective that it's relevant. So at some point, as I did for real estate, for example, you need to decide, you know, where it's your road. And then at that point in time, a bit of continuity, I think it's useful. Okay, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, I guess the next question I wanted to ask is that throughout your career, you've worked across different geographies, specifically in London and Milan. Um, yeah. How do the working environments differ and what benefit do you think this has had for you and your career? Yeah. So look, I think that also that has been most of the time driven by, uh, I have to say, the bank request in the sense that, you know, I started in London with Credit Suisse, then I spent a bit of time in Milan because uh, 
that country was booming at that point in time. And so basically the bank needed me more there than in London. Then I wanted to go back to London. Um, then at some point I was boring about London and I come back with City. But now, even if I'm formally in Milan, my team is actually in London and I cover Southern Europe and Nordic. So in a pre-COVID world, I was indeed the traveling like four or five days a week. So it's a bit here and there. So I think that there are, you know, advantages and it's not really advantages. It's, it's, it's really, again, uh, what is the ultimate objective? So I think that at the beginning of your career to be in the headquarter, it's really more beneficial because allow you to make uh, the network and the connection within the firm that it's important because, you know, it's a team, uh, <coughs> sorry, it's a team building, uh, uh, job where you need other people, other product, other coverage guy to help you. So it's very important that you establish yourself within your institution because otherwise you will struggle in the in the long term. However, I have to say that uh, in the example of Italy, there <coughs> the client is much more sophisticated than in some other countries. So the advantage that you have, like when you are in, in country like Italy, is that you do you know smaller stuff probably but with much more level of detail so you know from a technical perspective potentially you can get a, a bit more at early stage so again at some point you need to make a decision because i mean it makes sense to be in london if you want to be a product or an industry banker it makes sense to be in the country to me if you want to be a coverage bank but the sequence to me is like first you go to headquarter and then you move rather than vice versa. Very much for that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, kind of taking a step back to your extensive experience now, um, what was your motivation for transitioning um, from TMT over to real estate and lodgings? Yeah. And do you think that your experience in TMT has benefited you in your current sector? Uh, so let me start from the easy one. So the latter, the answer is no. Uh, in the sense there is not really, I mean, there is like some segment that somehow can be, you know, come out somehow linked like the data center, this kind of stuff, but in reality not. And again, why I moved uh, was a very opportunistic all the time. I mean, first of all, that happened in a very different, uh, let's say, uh, point in time from your career. So the dynamic and, uh, you know, the reason and the logic and the driver for that decision was completely different. Uh, and second was really much related about, uh, you know, again, the opportunity in the bank, right? Because when I moved from m to TMT it was because at that point in time, the Credit Suisse team was, you know, growing. There was a lot of, you know, consolidation wave in there. And I wanted to do like uh, going where there was like deals, right? Um, then if I think about um, then from TMT to leverage finance, again, it was much, really much driven by my willingness to learn that product in which Credit Suisse was and is particularly good. Um, and then like uh, I decided to go back to Italy for different reasons. I spent a bit of time in doing Italian coverage and then the real estate opportunity came up as, a, as an opportunity again, because there was uh, in 2015, 16, uh, a lot of you know new IPO in the real estate space. So I started to, to take care of a bit of those kind of stuff in Spain and Italy. And then the grow naturally came, there was space in the city platform. And so that remained my core business for now. Um, but again, every time I moved was really for specific reason at that point in time. Okay, great. Um, kind of to follow up on that, um, you've been working in investment banking for over 12 years now, while some people exit out to other opportunities. Um, what would you say um, it is about investment banking that has made you stay for this long? Yeah, so I would say a couple of considerations. First, that uh, I have not been particularly lucky in, ten, in terms of timing, in the sense that uh, people of my age that started in 2008, af after, after three months, uh, when I started, I remember we were like 107 people at the analyst training, and by November, post uh, Lehman failure, we were just 47, right? So that, that was like a point in time. And that lasted like up to, you know, 2010, 2011, to be honest, because there was a bit of recovery and then the crisis again. And, uh, and then was not so obvious to me, right? In the sense, of course, I had people that the usual transition when you are like a senior analyst, junior associate to the buy side, um, was not really something uh, that in terms of volume opportunities was that appealing at a point in time where the debt market was shutting down, et cetera, et cetera. 
Second is because, uh, frankly speaking, I I always been uh, like fine in the place where I was. So generally, I think if you're happy where you are, there is not really reason to change. Uh, so I never felt like, oh, I need to change, right? Because of course, I don't think that the money needs to be a driver, but that's just a consequence. So, and by the way, like the two industries were not so different at that point in time. So there was not really a real reason for me to change. Um, and then there was a bit, uh, you know, uh, the component about what really are you are going to do, right? So it's true that a lot of time in MA and from the bank perspective, there is a lot of free work where, you know, you need to pitch, you need to market yourself. And sometimes you basically work for nothing, but it's pretty much true also if you go on the buy side, right? Where you can spend like months on a file and then you are not the winning goals, et cetera. So, I think that overall the two the two aspects are not so different. And what allowed me to stay in banks so so long, it's really the multiple different things that you can do in one day. In the sense, really, when I the hours are never enough, right? When I get into the office, I have my to-do list. Rarely I go to the end, and you can see I have also today. Uh, really, you go to the end of the day where you really are able to do everything because staff come in, right? And so at that point in time, you probably are frustrated and even unhappy. But in reality, is that what happened is that that is like this diversification, this multiple, you know, work, etc., allow you to stay, you know, focused and to stay, you know, into into the game. Great, thank you. I found that very insightful. Um, I, I guess um, the next question I'd really like to ask would be: uh, since COVID nineteen has hugely impacted real estate, leisure, and lodging. Uh, how has your role changed since the start of the pandemic and how do you see the industry recovering? It's a very nice question, not just so obvious, um, in the sense no one has a crystal ball. I think that definitely the last six months and has been like a couple of considerations. First of all, real estate is, has been one of the, of the sector where there was not a recovery in the sense that in general, public real estate lost around 40% in the pre-COVID compared to the pre-COVID. They recover partially now probably the last are around 15 20 percent while most of the other sector recovered already so counterintuitively real estate has not been the usual defensive sector that people think it could be um so that's the first consideration second of course there's been a couple of sector retail and lodging that you mentioned that has been particularly hit and that basically drove uh, you know the entire market to show particularly care to liquidity and so a lot of activity on the debt side on one side has been satisfied by the bank and the liquidity that, that the european union put into the system that allowed those people to survive and second you know a huge access by all the players to capital markets on the debt side and uh, on the banking side so the most of the activity has been in that sector m a has been uh, you know pretty active i would say during the COVID period much more on the private side with you know asset based transaction that kept most of the value public m a much less couple of situation one where we are advisor for for a company that is doing a tender offer in the nordics for a five billion trade there is another situation in germany that they started but they are not successful for now so the reality is that there is still a disconnection between what we have seen in the public listed market as valuation compared to what people believe is the real value that is holding there quite well because in an environment where the interest rate would be lower for longer, real estate actually benefits, right? Because it's an asset class that can, can give you better returns than the 10 years bond or similar instrument. Now there is a spread of around 500 basis points between uh, you know, what the 10 years uh, money give you versus a real estate uh, asset and so what i expect that uh, we keep uh, seeing uh, movement on the debt side in the next few months uh, and potentially private capital trying to deploy capital while i think m a we need to wait a little bit the recovery in some price to see some m a mostly driven by shares deal rather than cash deal Great. Well, it sounds like an exciting time to be in, in this industry. So thank you. Um, I guess the next question I'd like to ask will be, um, of all the deals you've worked on during your career, is there any that particular stand, is there anyone that particularly stands out and why? Yeah, look, I think that uh, it's a very nice question. And again, go back to, you know, obviously over a career, you do different things at different point in time, right? 
uh, because of course your role is different uh, and also depending on how experience you have, uh, you might perceive something more and less useful. I have to say that if I need to pick up someone that was like most funny, um, was my first IPO that happened in Kazakhstan, so a country where I was never there, where we did the listing of the one that was the champion of mobile technology. It was fun also because the VP at that time, I was associate and the VP on that project decided to go for a sabbatical. The team didn't replace him. So basically at a relative junior level, I was like the person in charge for this with all this travel to, to, to Kazakhstan. It was pretty exciting, I would say. And, um, and that then we get it done, so it was good. Um, so that's probably the one that if you ask me, pick up one just because it was more funny. Another couple, otherwise, that was mentioned definitely um, the transaction between when El Buemash and Bulgari, El Buemash basically bought Bulgari, the Italian luxury player, was, was really good because it was very high profile and nice brand, etc. And I have to say that also the current one I'm working in in this uh, Nordic region is pretty exciting because there is a bit of everything interlopper, board of the target that is not recommending the offer. So, pretty exciting. So. Probably those three are the one that I would mention if uh, someone asks. That's great, thank you. Uh, over to you, Sargon. Yeah, um, I was just gonna say they all sound like very exciting deals to be working on. Um, but something I wanted to ask is that like any other industry, there are many challenges that can come in one's way. So what would you say has been the biggest challenge for you within investment banking and your career so far? Definitely to combine the, my free time with my professional time in the sense that uh, if you like your job, but even only if you have a real, let's say, sense of responsibilities, right, you really want to, you know, perform well. It's an extremely competitive environment and to perform well, it's a client driven business. So you need to spend time, right? And that it's not obvious how to balance your private life with your professional life for different reasons. Uh, when you are young, it's a matter of quantity of work and working hours. When you are getting growing, it's more responsibility. Then there is the client facing issue. So that's, that's, uh, it's, it's very tough. And also when you are home, it, you know, you need to find a way to stop at some point, right? Because potentially with the technology now, it's great because you can work from every angle, but it also, challenging because you can even stay home and work 24 seven. So I think that it's something that people need to, I mean, I found very difficult to balance in the right way. Thankfully, I, I found a great part and I have two lovely kids, but uh, it's not obvious. Thank you. Um, that's definitely some food for thought for everyone. Um, one last question. Uh, given your exposure to the industry, what would be your top tips for interviews and applications for students? You need to get there very motivated and very prepared in the sense that the competition now is very, very high. Uh, and independently of what has been your career in terms of student, I mean, of course, we are people that have been doing languages, so Greek, Latin, philosophy, arts, etc. Uh, because we'll look at the brain. But of course, at the same time, when people come here and they need to interview for a place, what do you expect? Very simplistic is that they know what they are applying for. And, uh, you know, a lot of people I have person that don't even know the difference between, I don't know, being a sale or a trader or being like an investment banker, right? And that's, it's not, it's not helpful, but not because, you know, the sake of it, it's just also for yourself, because then it would be a very, you know, challenging environment, very tiring. So you need to be very convinced about what you, what you're doing, right? Um, and then be informed, right? Now, there is a lot of information out there on how this process works, the kind of uh, question, the kind of, uh, attitude etc because at the end of the game there is of course uh, a lot of automatic filter that goes from grades hr etc but ultimately when you get to the final stage where people need to measure you they want to see someone with who the question i always ask myself is like okay if next year would be in a very challenging under pressure situation i would like this guy to work with me or this girl working with me right so you really need to try to transmit something to the other person in terms of being reliable, be excited, be uh, be ready. Brilliant, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, that's all the questions we had for you. Um, again, a massive thank you for joining us today and sharing your insights about your career and Excellent. the industry in general as well. 
um, I'm sure that everyone watching will greatly benefit from it. So thank you and best of luck for the future. Excellent. So guys, thank you very much for your time. I think it's a great initiative. I hope to be helpful and don't hesitate to contact me for any additional question or follow up. Thank you. Um, and everyone watching, please stay tuned for next Monday for our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.